Self-expansion is the essence of all aspiration. Why do we seek to possess things? Because by acquisition, we imagine we'll expand our dominion. Why do we seek to learn more? Because we think by enlarging our knowledge to expand our understanding. And why do we seek ever new experiences? Because we believe that through them we'll expand our awareness. When you stretch a lump of dough outward, it becomes not only broader, but thinner. Such often is the case when we stretch the mind only outwardly. Reaching out too far, we sacrifice depth in our lives. 
The self-expansion toward which all life aspires is of the spirit. An expansion of sympathy, of love, of the awareness that comes from sensing God's presence everywhere. And we're going to do the affirmation first out loud with a strong, awakened, ready, conscious voice. I feel myself in the flowing brooks. I feel myself in the flowing brooks. In the flight of birds. In the flight of birds. In the raging wind upon the mountains. In the raging wind upon the mountains. In the gentle da dance of flowers on a breeze. In the gentle dance of flowers and breeze, renouncing my little egoic self, renouncing my little egoic self, I expand with my great soul self off everywhere. I expand with my great soul self everywhere. Again, out loud, strong, conscious voice. I feel myself in the flowing brooks. I feel myself in the flowing brooks. In the flight of birds. In the, in the flight of birds, in the raging wind upon the mountains, in the raging wind upon the mountains, in the gentle dance of flowers on a breeze, in the gentle dance of flowers on the breeze, renouncing my little egoic self, renouncing my little egoic self, I expand with my great soul self everywhere. I expand with my great soul self everywhere. And now a little bit softer of a normal speaking voice. I feel myself in the flowing brooks. I feel myself in the flowing brooks. In the flight of birds. In the flight of birds. In the raging wind upon the mountains. In the raging wind upon the mountains. In the gentle dance of flowers on the breeze. Renouncing my little egoic self, renouncing my little egoic self, I expand with my great soul self everywhere. I expand with my great soul self everywhere. Now in a whisper, I feel myself in the flowing brooks. even deeper mentally. I feel myself in the flowing brooks, in the flight of birds, in the raging wind upon the mountains, in the gentle dance of flowers on the breeze. Renouncing my little egoic self, I expand with my great soul self everywhere. And I'm even a little deeper now, the eye of infinity at the super conscious level. I feel myself in the flowing brooks, in the flight of birds, in the raging wind upon the mountains, in the gentle dance of flowers on a breeze. Renouncing my little egoic self, I expand with my great soul self everywhere. And then if you feel to silently inwardly pray, beloved spirit and all that is, Help me in my own nothingness to find myself one with all that is. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So good, good to see you. And my name is Paul. This is your first time with us, and this is Padma. And a hello to those people in the digital realm as well who might be watching at home. So uh, this week's reading is from The Rays of the One Light, which is weekly commentaries on the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita. And this week's reading is, Does God Hide the Truth? Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it, with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramhansa Yogananda. 
In last week's reading, we saw that the great masters themselves counsel discretion in the dissemination of truth. The counter-argument is sometimes made, but the Lord doesn't hide. He reveals his beauty in the sunsets, his tender sympathy in the rain, his wrath in the thunder, his restless energy in the brooks, his power in the sunlight. There are exoteric truths and there are esoteric truths. There is that which is revealed impersonally and left up to us in to interpret, such as the thunder and our perception of it as divine wrath, the rain, and our perception of it as God's sympathy. But behind even God's most ex open expressions, there lies impenetrable truth. The wind blows where it wills, said Jesus in chapter 3 of the Gospel of St. John. You hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. As Sri Krishna says in the ninth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, by me, the whole vast universe of things is spread abroad. By me, the unmanifest. In me are all existences contained, not I in them. God's hidden reality cannot be understood by the reasoning faculty. In the Shankya, philosophy states frankly, Ishvar Ashidha. God is not provable. A willingness to seek the underlying reality behind appearances is essential for those who would love God. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Oh. door. I'm crying in the wilderness of loneliness. With eyes closed, I have long knocked at doors of darkness, praying that they will open and reveal thy light. With a million thirsty cravings of my heart, I long for thee. Oh, will thou come? I want to hear thy song in the silence of my soul. Thy gentle voice saying, come home, I often heard but through many lives it was drowned in the tumult of my wild cravings. I have forsaken the jostling crowds of desire. In the solitude of my mind, my devotion bursts to hear thy voice. Take away every dreary memory of earthly sounds that yet lurks in my mind. I want to hear thy still voice ever singing in the silence of my soul. Does God hide the truth? Um, I think we all will be safe to say we don't expect that God will, uh, he might, but most of the time he does not appear in front of us as, as the saying goes in India, you know, um, Narayan, uh, another um, aspect of God, he, is, uh, he has four hands, he's holding the Shankha, <coughs> the conch in one hand, uh, the chakra in one hand, the chakra is the main, not the mace, um, I forget the English name of it, the, 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 the discus, uh, and then the mace is his lower hand and the, 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 the lotus flower is in the other hand, and each one has a symbol. But the saying goes that God will not appear to us in the Shankha Chakra Gadapadda in that form, uh, but what he does is he hides himself, true but he's always talking through us, through, through agents, through people, through nature, in our own hearts. <clears throat> and why, it, why does it seem God is hiding himself? Well, Master said it pretty um, 
as he always does, uh, succinctly, uh, that for so many years, for millions of years, we haven't even cared about God. We never cared to love Him. We never even thought about Divine Mother for millions of years, for millions of incarnation. And why would Divine Mother listen to you now? She's testing us. She has to make sure that our love is true. And, and yes, when our love is true, and just like the chant, when we can say, I want only Thee, Lord, truly, I want only Thee, she will have to come, and she will come. And until then, she will remain hidden. The other thing is, um, you know how, um, I mean, imagine 200 years from now, uh, you give, give th those people 200 years back, our ancestors, and show them a television set. And they will say, what is this? This is black magic? What is that box? They have people, little people inside there, and they're talking, right? But we know what's going on. It's this, this the, the atmosphere is filled with, with frequencies, things that we cannot see, but they are real, and they are transmitting energy. And those energies can be captured in form of sounds and images. And such is also the nature of us and God. And so we think of the receiver. The most important thing here is the receiver and receiving. And so God is inundated all around us. I, I love that, um, that little visualization from uh, Vedanta. Vedanta says Brahma is everywhere. So imagine um, there's a little school going on under the ocean and little fishes are being taught by the fish teacher. And the fish teacher is saying, okay kids, now, all around you is water. And little fishes go, water? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> That's Brahma. And so all around us, we are inundated with, with God, with Divine Mother. Can we think of anything, any thought, anything in solid form, liquid, gas, ether, vapor, energy, that is, doesn't has God? Because God is in and out of his own creation. But we can't see it. We can't feel it. Because our receivers are not tuned correctly. But what happens? And, and Master has taught us how to tune this instrument. Because he, he said, and, and so, does all, so do all Masters, that this is the instrument with which we will find God. We will feel him. And we will um, see him. Uh, not with our human eyes, not with our human senses, but within us, inside us. And um, in the reading that Paul read, um, the Spirit, God, is likened to the wind. And just as uh, the wind cannot be seen, the Spirit cannot be seen, but the Spirit is animated from within. And that's where we have to go inside and tune our instruments and remove all the turbulences of the mind and when the mind is still and the body is still, whatever remains is God. And we, yes, and we do commune with God in, in many ways. Um, you know, I always wondered, I'm sure all of us as devotees have wondered about this, that when, um, when avatars like Master comes in a human body, uh, many people have just seen that, a human body. There would be his neighbors, and I remember I think somebody wrote down how his neighbors always thought he was a kind man. Why? Because he shared his fruits with the neighbors. Um, there would be people he would meet and they wouldn't know. The same thing, isn't it? So we have to, we have to, you could go to holy places and be completely oblivious of the, the holy vibrations. Um, you could go to Mount Washington just to visit. You could go to Lake Shrine, as people do. And, and maybe perchance, God is waiting, perchance we will be able to tune in and listen. Because he is constantly talking. We say he's hidden, but I think it's us who has closed our souls, closed our hearts. And that's why we see. God is hidden. God is everywhere, has exposed himself to us. And then in the reading we also heard, just like the wind, um, just as the wind goes, um, uh, the wind goes, wind flows everywhere and anywhere. There's no rule 
uh, that can bind the wind and say, okay, you have to go that way. Same thing with spirit. Um, rules, regulations, um, they don't bind the spirit. What does is devotion, love. So, so the other aspect is, in, if we want to bind the infinite, we have to, we have to love. That's the only way the infinite will, will give himself to us. Uh, there is the story of Yashoda, Krishna's mother. So Krishna was a very uh, naughty boy, and uh, <laughs> and then and, and God in that form would not listen to his mom and do all kinds of uh, naughty things. Would uh, Yashoda would make the churn the cream, and he would go and steal them and break the pots and go uh, uh, after the neighbors, uh, the the beautiful uh, the. The, the milk maids uh, and would break their pots, they would carry pots of milk on their head and they would go and throw stones and they would break and they would come and uh, complain about him to Yashoda. So all of this drama and Yashoda one day got fed up and he said, okay, I'm going to tie you to this post so you wouldn't be able to do any of your naughty deeds. And so he took, she took a rope and um, to tried to tie Krishna. And it fell short, so she went and found a bigger rope and tried to tie him again, and that too fell short. And no matter how big the rope she was trying to tie him with, it always fell short. And then she realized that he is, so this is an allegorical story, you cannot tie the infinite with the finite little rope. So she prayed, and, and of course she was able to tie him. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so this is the story that Master and Swamiji have told many times to remind us the only way we can catch the infinite, we can tie the infinite permanently in our hearts is through love, through love and devotion. Um, you know, uh, the nature of the nature of a devotee's love, the nature of a devotee's devotion is very simple. It's not complicated at all. God, God himself is very simple, as Master would say. If God knew how great he was, he doesn't know how great he was. It's just a way of, you know, it's another way of expressing. He used to express his love for Divine Mother. Um, there used to be, a, I think, a spastic, uh, a special needs person who used to live in the ashram. His name was Horace. And uh, we obviously, he couldn't be of much help around the ashram, but he would generally help out in little things in perhaps the garden and maybe help someone um, in, inside the building taking a class. And then one day Master was talking about how, you know, so and so will find God in this lifetime, so and so will become, a, um, uh, will be completely free um, or somebody would be um, partially free. And then he said, Horace, he'll find God in this lifetime. He's very close. And so another um, disciple, I think it was James, he said, that must be a very simple love master, isn't it? Because Horace was a very simple person. He wasn't capable of any, any complex given his physical condition, mental condition. And God says, that's exactly it. We have to have very, very simple love. Um, it is so easy when you think about that. When a, when a bhakti yoga talks about God, all he can think of is just devotion. It's a very simple love, just simply love God. And then you think about it, and you find how hard is it just to love God, because so many other things come in and disturbs that, that devotion that we always have. We all have that devotion. Um, we came from that source. We are part of that source. So we are all that God is. It's just that we have forgotten. And we've come far away. And now it's time for us to go home. And, and as we are turning around, and as we deeply call out, I'm tired of this life. I don't, want, I don't want any more of these complexities. Please show me the way back to you, back to your love and your joy. And then agents like Master appears in our lives, and other, other Masters appear in our lives. On this path, I can speak of all these masters that have come to help us out. Because, again, it's very hard for us to focus our devotion on the infinite. We need a form. And so, so, and so we have master. 
and he's here, he, he shows us techniques, he tells us how to hold our bodies and minds still, he shows us the different attitudes we must have. Someone asked Master, what is the most important um, thing a disciple can do? And he replied, the, the two most important things that a disciple should have is sincerity and devotion. And we have to be absolutely sincere in our, in our ways, um, trying our very best. That's all we can do. You know, um, think of the boat, and this is a saying from Vedanta again. It's like we are that little boat, and our sincerity, our hard work, whatever we can do, the best we can do, is like the sail. And so our job is to lift our sail. And then the, the wind of spirit is constantly blowing. It may seem hidden because the sail is not up yet, and so the boat is not moving. But if we can pull the sail up, the boat moves. We don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, so we have to pull our, pull our sails up. Um, well, there are so many real hooks that Master has given us because precisely of this reason. It is so hard. It is so easy in one way, but it's so incredibly hard. So he, um, in the last year of his life, um, he, I think it was the last Christmas that he was in the body, and he led his disciples into singing that song, Do not dry the ocean of my love in the fires of my desire. Um, they would sing again and again and again and again. <clears throat> and then he said, I know Jesus is here. And sing that song to him in your hearts. And I, am, I, I have imbibed my vibration because we have done this today. Later, and I think he was also speaking to all of us who were not there that day, that later, whenever you feel delusion is coming and overcoming you, sing this song. Do not dry the ocean of my love. Um, and you will find God's response in your hearts. You know, so little, and I can't say little, these are big things. And he has given so many, and, and he himself said, I have given you so many things, just do 1% of what I have given you. Of the 100 things I have told you, just do one, and sincerely, and you'll find freedom in this lifetime. That's a huge promise, isn't it? Um, every time we do purification, I'm just amazed by the words that Master speaks through us. Master says, open your heart to me, and I will enter and take charge of your life. I've never heard of such promises before. Can you imagine? Let's, we can meditate on that itself. Master is promising, if we open our hearts to him, he promises to step in and take charge of our lives. Just, just think about that for a moment. How huge is that? And what does that imply then? If I have done that and Master is in charge of our lives, then everything that is happening in my life is not a coincidence. It's not a bad luck. It's coming directly from Him. And so, just like the prescription is not always sweet, in fact, prescription is never sweet. <laughs> um, it is bitter sometimes, but if we have that insight as to what is trying to happen is, this is a prescription that I need. How many times have we been uh, in a haste to go somewhere and we're driving, and that particular slowest of the slow car will come in front of us? <laughs> have you thought of that, why that happens? Because we have attracted it. By our own restlessness, by our impatience, the universe is, is such a wonderful, um, perfectly um, created, designed to, to cater to our needs. As soon as we have set out that impatient, impatience um, and restlessness, we get the reply in terms of, okay, you need a lesson. You have to better your patience and restlessness, and here you go. So we, we attract those events in our life, and so, and it can get a little, you know, mental, and we, 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 I don't think we need to put our mind into this. If we open our heart, once again, coming back to Master's promise, so things do happen in our lives, which is just not happy. Makes, it makes us anxious. Uh, we worry what is going to happen in the future. We don't know what's going on right now. Things are not going well. 
Open your heart to Master. Feel His presence. Feel His assurance in your heart. And He's saying, it's okay. I am in charge of your life. Give it up to me. And so when we do that, we are also saying at the same time, Master, your will is my will. We are constantly saying that. That is the meaning of Him taking control of our lives. So I am not really, I, I'm trying to kill Padma. And when Padma is no longer in charge, guess who is? Master and God. And all's well. And life is never more happier, never more fulfilling. And it's, it's full of joy. And, and you don't have to worry anymore, and worries go away. And, and of course, that, and I can give you examples, like somebody um, in the village, she had gone for seclusion. And these are long time devotees. They have been on the path for a long, long time. And she comes out of her seclusion and finds her um, house burnt to ashes. But you wouldn't be able to tell that by looking at the person. So you would still have these challenges. Is that the challenges don't seem as overwhelming as before. Why? The challenges have not changed. Because our karma, we can't change it yet. The past things that we have done will come back and haunt us. But in the process, we have made ourselves stronger. And when we are strong, then the other, the opponent looks like a baby. And we are fighting babies now. <laughs> so it doesn't um, feel that hard anymore. Um, so we have to, as devotees of Master, let's keep these things in mind. So um, uh, he said this in his own words. When you go to Mount Washington, he said, I have meditated in every corner of Mount Washington, and I have placed my vibration here. So the next time we go to Mount Washington, we need to feel his presence. We need to feel that vibration. When Lake Shrine was open, uh, Swami Krananda says, Lake Shrine, and if you haven't, I don't know if there's anyone in this group who hasn't visited, but if you haven't, people out there, uh, please do, because it's one of the most beautiful places on earth, really. And to be in so in the, such a bustling city of Los Angeles, Santa Monica, it's just amazing how Master found that perfect place. Um, but on the day um, when Mount Wash, when Lake Shrine was um, about to get dedicated, he and several disciples, he said, okay, we're going to go all inside the water. And they went in the water, stayed in the water for a long time, and Master said, I'm blessing this water. So when people will come, millions will come, and they will feel this presence of God in this place. How many people do we know? I know I can speak of so many people, friends who, are, who have no understanding of um, either master or the path or no inclination towards spirituality um, yet they have gone to Lake Shrine and they'll come back, oh Lake Shrine, we talk about um, Yogananda and the first thing they say is Lake Shrine, I went with my boyfriend there and they like that place. So, so such is the vibration and, and then we as deputies, our job is to tune into that and as we tune into it more and more we feel God's presence, and He's not hidden anymore. He's more real than all of us in this room, because that is our true reality.